Hey, Kyle. Hey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, and thank you to the Digital Freedom Festival for this stupid hangover I have today. Like, I just want one of those sofas up here, and I'll just like talk to you like while I'm lying down. Um, but that's Riga, right? So, yeah, I'm Michael, and um, I have a company called Copenhagenized Design Company, and we work with cities around the world in how to make them more bicycle friendly. I design the infrastructure for cities, I help them with their strategies, with communication, um, and we have offices in four cities around the world, and, and uh, everything we do revolves around putting the bicycle back as transport in our cities. And this is a thing, people. This is something that is happening all over the world. Ten years ago, very few cities were talking about the bicycle as transport, and now virtually every city in the world has had at least the conversation. And then some cities are doing a lot more than others. Um, it's important for me to just hammer out one important thing here, that I am not a cyclist. I don't identify as a cyclist. I don't have the goofy spandex, uh, the fancy road bikes, uh, the helmets, the gloves, and all that stuff. Um, none of the people who work for me are cyclists. We don't, you know, this is not a part of, our, 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 of who we are. Uh, you know, if I'm in a bar in America um, and I say, I'm a cyclist, they instantly get like a, an image of me in spandex, which would not be good. Um, and I'd probably go home alone that night as well, so I don't even talk about that. Um, I mean, it's, you know, we're just regular people in cities who use bicycles to get around because we can, because it's 2018. I also have a TV series, which I hope Latvian TV will buy at some point, uh, called The Life Size City, where I travel around the world to cities and curate all of these amazing things that are happening. I call it the age of urbanism. People are citizens. It's an amazing citizen movement in every city in the world, tired of waiting for the municipality to do something, so they just said, yeah, let's just go out and do it ourselves, right? And let's make this park. My kids need a safe place to play, or, you know, and, and people are just doing it themselves. Um, you can check it out. Uh, there's some clips uh, on YouTube, um, and it's really an amazing inspiration. So everything I do when I get out of bed in the morning is about urbanism and putting bikes back into cities, and it's a pretty cool job. So... I've been doing this for like 10 years, talking about this, and back in the day, like eight years ago, nine years ago, I used to do like really crappy photoshops of rush hour for bicycles in Copenhagen, put into a local context to say, this is where you need to go. This is where you should be headed. And this is uh, Mexico City. Eight years ago, I spoke there, and I uh, did this little photoshop, and I was there last week working, and they kind of did it. Okay, I mean, it's a big city. They're, they're not Copenhagen yet, but like they have 700,000 people just in a few years riding bikes, you know, commuting to work and education. That's just on their main boulevard. I was just astounded. Um, I, did a, I spoke in Riga eight years ago, and I did a same kind of Photoshoppy thing, um, and then I saw what has happened since, and fuck my life, basically. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, th th I love this photo. Like, there's all these little side streets, well, you can ride a bike here, but only for five meters and then get off your damn bike. I mean, you know, there is a global movement. P cities around the world are, are doing this, you know, and you have like Mexico City, you have all these other cities I'll talk about later, and then you have cities like Riga uh, who haven't done a lot. Um, activism here, like, you know, modern activism, showing what things should be like. In, in, Riga is in the world class. The people here doing stuff like this, man, this is stuff that we talk about. This is what we see on Twitter. So there's a re that's kind of cool here that you have these people saying, yeah, let's just do it. And like tactical urbanism and just photoshops like this, showing people. Because you can't just talk, talk, talk about it. You've got to show what it's going to look like. And uh, so world class activism here. And yesterday I spent an, uh, an entire hour with the mayor of Riga. Uh, in his office uh, with a huge map, and this guy's super high energy. You live with this politics, so I'm not going to comment on that, but he was just like, Michael, <laughs> I'm doing something. I know what I need to do, and now we're going to start working on it, and he was just, he was trying to sell me the fact that he gets it. They do this all over the world, all these mayors. They try to, you know, show me that they're actually thinking about it, but it was a really, it was a fascinating hour, and really intense, and an enjoyable discussion. So, uh, based on what he's tweeting and stuff, you might see more of me here, uh, and my team. So, let's, let's uh, cross our fingers for that. I like to talk about, you know, bikes, yeah. He hasn't done anything yet. Wait for that, okay? Let's, like, you know, you can you know, be smacking him maybe before you're clapping. I don't know. We'll see. But it, it was positive anyway. Um, so, urban democracy. It's not just like bike, 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 fuck bikes. I mean, it's, it's about urban democracy, okay? And uh, I love, there's no photo there. 
There should be a really beautiful photo that I took right there. It's not, in the, it's not on the screen over there? No? Okay. Um, I love the streets. The streets of our cities, I find them to be beautiful. I can wax poetic about them. They are the skeletal structure of our city organism. They're the, the veins that pump the lifeblood of a city out to every corner of the urban landscape. And they, they, they were beautiful, and they can be beautiful again. For 7,000 years, the streets of our cities were the most democratic spaces in the history of Homo sapiens. We did everything in the streets. They were extensions of our homes. We transported ourselves. We, we bought and sold things. We flirted. We found people to fall in love with, to have babies with, to have sex with. We did everything in the streets. Our children played there as well. I mean, this is what it looked like. It was universal in every city around the world for 7,000 years. Democratic spaces. Then we went and invented the automobile. That's one thing, but then we started pumping them into our cities. And we've done a lot of stupid things as homo sapiens, but this is, this is in the top five. This is really one of the stupidest things we ever did, thinking that cars actually fit in our cities. And what happened when it, you know, back in the 1910s and 1920s when cars started to appear in our cities, I mean, there was a massive traffic, traffic safety problem. Cars started killing people uh, from day one, and nobody had a solution for this. And what we did was we gave the job to the engineers, and we said, you got to fix this. So what happened was this really interesting, well, depressing kind of change in perception from democratic spaces for 7,000 years to really puzzles to be solved with mathematical equations, right? Sewage and electricity and water supply, and now streets were put into that category. Really uh, a massive change in perception. The automobile industry had a problem. Uh, everybody hated them. There's a thing called the anti-automobile age. If you hit, a, hit somebody in a city, in a car in the 1920s in America, you'd get pulled out of that car, almost lynched. Right? I mean, it was, it was, it was the, the least cool thing you could do was drive a car in a city. But this, the automobile industry spent 20 years spinning this their way, trying desperately to change our perception of streets. And they succeeded. It was like one of the greatest marketing uh, uh, you know, campaigns in history. And at the end of it, we're all going, yeah, okay, cars belong in streets. Everybody else, get out of the way. It was the greatest paradigm shift in the history of our cities. Uh, this, this change of perception that streets are for cars and not a democratic space anymore. There are no photos on the, in the slides, dude. You have no photos? Because like, okay. Um, not giving you shit, I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is my favorite quote in the world, and uh, it really is a sign of the times. The fact is that automobiles no longer have a place in the big cities of our time. I wish it was my quote, but it's not. It was the mayor of Paris for 12 years. This guy came into power and he just went, eh, I want to make Paris nicer. Very un-French of him, you know. It was just like really humble and uh, super cool guy, an older gentleman. Um, he said, let's make it nice. And so bicycles were at the forefront of his revolution. You know, 20,000 bike share bikes in Paris, but also traffic calming. In 2020, 85% of Paris will be in a 30 kilometer an hour zone. 85% of that city, slow speeds for cars, feels nicer, people are safer. But he's not alone. It's not just this one crazy French dude, you know. It is politicians all over the world. Uh, mayors in Buenos Aires, in Vancouver, uh, in New York as well are saying the same thing. This is a reason to be optimistic that we are moving to a new paradigm shift, what I call back to the future. So this is a, a short history of traffic engineering. For 7,000 years, we prioritized our primary transport forms by giving them a fast A to B, right? That's how we thought. 1900 came along, the bicycle was rocking the world. You know, Riga was an amazing bicycle city. Every city was. Uh, public transport had appeared, uh, and still, we were rational. 1920s, the car had appeared, and still, we were pretty rational. And then it came from America, in the 1940s, 1950s, washing over the world like a tsunami. The Soviets adapted it. Uh, they won't admit it, but I mean, basically everything about Soviet traffic planning is copied, pasted from America. And really, all of our cities around the world are on the right. The car has been given a fast A to B at the expense of everybody else just trying to get around the city. You know, it's like a video game, you know, trying to ride a bike around Riga, you know. It's like, okay, what do I do here? Oh my God, what's this, you know, obstacles and everything. I mean, this is, this is what we did, and this is what we're living with, and we should fix it. So this is how we fix it. This is my uh, traffic planning guide for modern cities. You provide a fast A to B for the three transport forms on the right, and you make driving a car a pain in the ass. 
I could just like mic drop right there, but this is a hard mic to drop. Um, I mean, that's all we need to do. All the campaigns in the world for ride a bike, man, it's good for you. Ride a bike and save a polar bear on your bicycle today. Save the world on a bicycle. These campaigns are irrelevant unless we're doing the fourth thing. They're a waste of money. Um, we know, I work with transport psychology, and we know that the, the, the three transport forms on the left are intermodal by nature. If my bike tire's flat in the morning in Copenhagen, oh, I chuck it in the bike shop, and I take the metro or the bus to work. I'm like 10 minutes late. I can never be more than 10 minutes late for work. It kind of sucks sometimes when you don't want to go to work. But we know that motorists are the last form of transport to change their behavior. I mean, you know, you can call in you know, to the boss going, my car is broken. I, I mean, the boss is like, oh my God, fix that car. Take all the time you need, my God. You know, everybody else is just going, huh, eh, 10 minutes late, right? We can switch. It's not difficult for us um, to change our transport forms. We have to change a lot of questions in our cities. We've been stuck in our ways for about 70 years because of this traffic engineering dominance in our thinking. Um, and the most important question regarding transport is this one. For about 70 years, we've only asked one question of our traffic engineers. Their entire education is based on so, you know, at this question. How many cars can we fit down this street here? You know, I need more cars down there. I need to improve flow, reduce congestion. How many cars? The question that modern cities are asking now is this. How many people? Can we move down a street? Using all this cool stuff we've invented, public transport, trams, metros, buses, bikes, that is the question in er the age of urbanization. People are moving to our cities like never before. We need to move people down a street, and we know how to do it. This model here, with this that I made in Photoshop, um, I mean, I, I can move 10 times the people down a street than the model that we just copy-pasted from the Americans and the Soviets uh, you know, in the 1950s. 10 times the amount of people. Um, moving through a city. Anthropology and transport psychology, I work with both of these things. We need to understand a lot of things about, about you know, bicycles in cities and public transport. Um, we know why people ride bicycles in Copenhagen. Uh, that's like a, a snowstorm a couple of years ago in the morning rush hour. We ask them, the city of Copenhagen asks them every two years, what's your main reason for riding a bike? They've been doing it since 1996. They have a good data set. And it never changes. The majority always says, dude, it's quick. It's simply, like Copenhagen, everything's 20 minutes in Copenhagen, even if it's 30. It just feels like it's 20 minutes. You're always fastest uh, on a bike. Uh, uh, you know, some people say, oh, I get that 30 minutes a day of, you know, of, of, you know, for my health. I hear that's important these days. And I feel good about myself riding my bike uh, with my music and my basket or whatever. Great. Only 6% ride because it's cheap and only 1% ride to save the planet, man, for environmental reasons. Right? So a lot of campaigns in other countries, like in Germany and the States, it's all focused on this environmental message and nobody cares anymore. Like we've heard, had it for 50 years. If you, if you make it possible for people to do it, then they will do it. If there's a win for them, they're going to do it. Every homo sapien who has ever lived has only wanted the one thing, where it's universal. We want to go fast from A to B. I call it A to Bism, right? I mean, I'm instantly, I'm, you know, if I have to leave this room, I'm already navigating. I'm already going, okay, where's the quickest route? Should I just jump off the stage? Or I get bound? You know, there's stairs there. I will actually try and figure out how to get to the door quickly. We all do it 24 hours a day. Um, okay, maybe not when we're sleeping, but anyway. I mean, this is really a key element in understanding how to get people to ride bicycles. You, you outperform the other transport forms. Uh, you make the bicycle the quickest default, and that is what gets people on the bikes, not telling them that it's good for them, okay? And uh, you combine the bicycle with public transport as well, right? That intermodality is incredibly important. People will drive cars in a city if it's the fastest way to go. And uh, if, we, if we do something different, we plan our cities differently, we're going we're gonna to nudge them or shove them into uh, another behavior. Okay. There we go. So this is the world's busiest bicycle. Was that the next slide? This is the world's busiest bicycle street in Copenhagen. Uh, 42,000 bikes a day in and out of the city. And um, it's really interesting to work with direct human observation. You know, I got a lot of people calling me from different, you know, data companies saying, oh, yeah, we want to do some kind of big tech, big data thing about getting people to ride bikes and stuff. No, I mean, what you need to do is build the infrastructure. Um, and the city of Copenhagen is pretty good at this. So this is incredibly busy route. For about 120 years of this intersection, everybody just went into the city center and back again. All roads lead to Rome. But then the city noticed that a couple hundred people a day were cutting across a sidewalk to get to a parallel street. 
And the city was going, why did they do that? They've never done that before. And they realized that there's a new development south of Copenhagen. So a few hundred people a day were breaking the law. You can't ride a bike on a sidewalk in Denmark. They're breaking the law for like 30 meters in order to get out of the busy rush hour, but also to get around the city center. Some cities would put up barriers to stop these people from doing this illegal activity or have the police hand out tickets. But the city of Copenhagen went, nah, we're going to do something different. We're going to test it. The people are telling us something. And they put in a temporary bike lane across the sidewalk, and they watched. Pilot project, six months. And uh, the number of people using it, was, it just exploded. So the city went, great, this is an important link that we need to make here. So they made a permanent cycle track uh, across the sidewalk. And now the numbers are like thousands a day using this shortcut. This is what we call desire lines. It's the most beautiful expression in urban planning. Um, it's the people of our cities are telling us how they want to use the city 24 hours a day, seven days a week, sending us little messages in bottles about, you know, I want to go here, right? And traffic engineering and traffic planning in many cities for many years has been incredibly arrogant. Okay, yeah, you're going to go here because we, we basically are telling you to go this way, right? And, but the people are going, yeah, but I don't want to go there. I want to go here, right? And, and this is the modern way to plan cities is like listening to the citizens because they are the experts. They know more than all of us traffic uh, planners and engineers put together. This is democracy in movement. Um, I discovered that we've had the bicycle for about 130 years and nobody anywhere in the world, I looked, man, I spent ages looking for, in, in lots of languages, looking for behavioral studies of cyclists from anywhere in the world in the past 130 years. There was nothing. Nobody had really looked at this. The bicycle was so completely normal in all of our lives for many, many years that we didn't even think about it. It was like a vacuum cleaner. You know, you don't sit there and, you know, fetishize your vacuum cleaner. It's just a tool for making your daily life easier. And that's how we regarded the bicycle for so long. So I decided that we needed some behavioral studies. Um, and so what I did in 2012 was I stuck a camera out the window in uh, at my apartment and I filmed an intersection for 12 hours. We had a lot of pedestrian studies in the 50s, 60s and whatnot. Um, so I, I was inspired by that. So I just filmed the intersection for, uh, for 12 hours. And then I hired an anthropologist. No traffic experience whatsoever. And I said, here, study those animals, that f those flock animals going through the intersection there, and uh, map their, their transport trajectories. And so she did. Uh, 16,631 cyclists in that intersection. Um, not even a bit busy intersection in Copenhagen. Um, but she just sat there and mapped the desire line of every single individual going through that intersection on a bike, as well as pedestrians and cars. Since then, we've looked at 100, I've stared at 106,000 cyclists in five cities around the world uh, in order to, to, to figure out how they're using these intersections, which are incredibly car-centric. You know, it's universal around the world. The city of Amsterdam hired us to, to, to film intersections and suggest how to make them better for bikes, how to Im improve the flow of bicycles through these intersections. And nobody's done this before. You just find out stuff. Uh, being the first person to find stuff out is always cool. And, and, and it changes the conversation. You know, even in Copenhagen, you'll have people saying, oh, those damn cyclists, you know, they're reckless or crazy. Everybody has a perception of this. Nobody could tell me how many cyclists in Copenhagen broke a Danish traffic law. There was no data. There was just lots of crazy guesses. So when we finished these, uh, the first uh, study, we found out that it's only 7%. 93% do everything by the book. I got this number and I went to all these key people in Copenhagen, the mayor, all these other politicians. I'm going, okay, how many do you think it's going to be in this intersection? And they're all going, oh, 25, 30, 50. One guy said 60%. Like, everybody's breaking laws. The Wild West. And I'm going, yeah, dude, it's like seven. And it's really only one. One percent. We call them reckless. These are the people that we all hate. They're everywhere. They're in the shopping mall, in the supermarket, in the bowling alley. The 1% are always going to be, you know, the people that we hate. The bad apples, as it were. Um, then we looked at the 6%. Because understanding how to plan for bicycles is understanding the nature of the machine. It is a momentum machine. I mean, what's the worst thing that can happen uh, while you're riding your bike, apart from getting hit by a car? Uh, it's stopping. It's like somewhere deep in our brain, we're going, oh, God, I have to stop. You know, oh, I have to get off the saddle. Oh, my God, okay. Um, and then I have to propel this machine into momentum again, right? I mean, it's not hard, but it's, it's there. So we know that people on bikes will try not to stop. So understanding that changes the conversation. Oh, they're, they're not doing this to irritate us. They're doing it because that's the nature of the bicycle. And, and it was, it's really interesting. A lot of people uh, in this intersection, 
the anthropologist, uh, she calls me over. She says, Michael, I see a pattern. And I'm going, oh my God, Michael loves patterns. He loves data. And, um, and she said, yeah, so these momentumists, like they're, 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 they're kind of, they're breaking the law, like this guy. It's really hard to see. I don't know why, these, my photos are awesome, but I don't know why they're not showing up very well here. This guy in the, in the pedestrian crossing, he is breaking the law. He's trying to get through the intersection, snaking through the intersection, trying to catch the lights instead of doing the standard, you know, 90 degree turn. And um, she said, yeah, a lot of, they're doing it, but you know, none of us have to be experts in anthropology to maybe assume that if I do something socially unacceptable to you, which I probably did at the party last night, so sorry if I did, okay? But I would make myself smaller, right? I'd be, oh my God, I'm so sorry. You know, we, we, we shrink. We try to make ourselves invisible to the rest of the flock, right? That's kind of how we operate. But you would assume that somebody breaking the law in the public space would be doing that. They would like, sort of like shrink down on their bike and sort of like look down and try to, to avoid our eyes. The opposite was true. All of the people who were breaking the law as momentumists, they actually made themselves larger. Like this guy, he's standing up on his bike. Like, you know, he's, he's sort of, he's advertising the fact that he's breaking the law. He's aware of it. He knows it's not cool, but he wants to let us know that you know, it's not a big deal. He's rolling slowly through the intersection. Other people would like get off their bike, but then pretend it's a scooter. It's not, it's not even a bike now, dude. It's a scooter. Like, see, no. And then they get back on their bike and they ride away. And they were all, they were doing this. So they were incredibly considerate to the rest of us. And when we zoomed in on their faces, we noticed another pattern. They all had this stupid look on their face, like kind of like a smile. I'm not looking at anybody, but I'm kind of like looking around, you know, and, and it's not, I'm sorry, you know, it's like they're apologizing. I know I'm breaking the law. It's, you know, give me five more meters and we're done. And sorry, everybody, look how big I am. I'm aware of my behavior and I want to let you know. And then they hit the infrastructure on the other side and boom, and they just went to the same, you know, posture and they rode off to work. You know, so these people actually, like I said, consider it, you know, they weren't like the, that 1% who just blow through uh, an intersection and little old ladies are jumping for their lives. That was really interesting. Breaking the law is one thing, but how they're doing it, we thought that was incredibly important to talk about. And, you know, there's no app, there's no, no you know, way of measuring all of this that beats 250 hours of direct human observation, humans studying humans. This is Halifax in Canada. I have worked in there a few years ago. Canada's oldest urban park. And they have these green lines in the middle, the original pathways from 1789. And then it snowed. And there were people walking and riding bikes on those red lines, carving desire lines straight as arrows through the snow. It snowed the next day, boom, those lines were identical, even though they couldn't see the path from the day before. A modern city observes, and they say, okay, this is Halifax in the two, you know, 2016, it's not Halifax in 1789 anymore, so let's make some new pathways to accommodate for the modern city. We need an urban revolution, man. There are so many cities doing baby steps. You know, we're gonna put in one bike lane on this street. Let's see how that works. Yeah. Um, I can't get to the bike lane safely. I can't, <laughs> when I get off the other end of the bike lane, I'm back among the, the sharks again. You know, that's completely useless, right? There's no network. It's just one little bit of infrastructure. So a politician can say, see, I'm so clever. Look at what I made. Wee. I mean, it's completely irrelevant. We need an urban revolution and we know how to do it. It's happening around the world. I talk about the arrogance of space. I looked down at, from the Eiffel Tower at this intersection uh, in, in Paris, and I said, holy shit, look at all that space. And I go back to the office, I put a filters on it, like square meters, and that ocean of red is basically only for automobiles. And then I look at uh, you know, how many people are using um, this ocean of red. Like this intersection with the curved curbs, that was like 1950s. It's like, oh, cars should not have to slow down as they drive through our cities. That was that fast A to B for cars. Uh, we know better now. I mean, you have you know, 23 humans in cars, given all of that space. You have, what, 20, 38 humans on pedestrian islands waiting for permission from the traffic engineering lights to, to cross the street to see the damn Eiffel Tower. It's the, one of the busiest pedestrian intersections on the planet, and you can see who's prioritized here. It's, it's completely arrogant. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, so last century, right? Um, fixing that is incredibly easy. It took me like you know, 15 minutes with a pencil, and then an intern like a couple hours in Photoshop. We know how to fix it, you know, and uh, 
This went viral in France. They're going, oh my God, I'm, yeah, well, it's that easy. I'm sorry, it's really that easy. We can fix it, make it bicycle friendly. Uh, we can save lives. And why don't pedestrian crossings like do, <laughs> do the curve? Because pedestrian, no pedestrian does like a 90 degree turn, right? We're all going, ah, oh, fuck it, it's a desire. You're going, why, why? That's something so simple, right? As well as the bicycle infrastructure. That's humans, man. They're telling us what they're doing. Even the local activists here know, you know they, they, do, they do similar graphs inspired by ours. Um, you know, the, you know, the cars are given 84% of the space on that street. This is not democracy, you know? You, like, you look at like Latvia, you look at like Estonia, and we hear all these amazing things, these young dynamic countries focus on startups and tech, and we're going, yeah, awesome, you know? I live in Denmark, we're going, yeah, we know the story. And then you walk out of the building, and it's the Soviet fucking Union, you know? It's like, seriously, dude? You, I thought you guys were free, okay? Because you're still locked into this uh, last century uh, transport mentality where there is only a transport dictatorship. Um, so good luck with that shit. So uh, this is the world's busiest bicycle street again, and there was a massive transformation in 2006. Um, this is one of our most densely populated neighborhoods. Only 17% own a car in this neighborhood. They have lots of other options, so they use those. Um, and the city redesigned this entire street. They, uh, they have one lane for cars, and now the cycle tracks on either side are like four meters wide in both directions. And there's, you know, there's buses as well. And uh, the city did this. They widened the sidewalks, made wide cycle tracks, left some space for cars. Fine. Um, and then they said, great. This bridge, nobody ever stopped on this bridge, like for 150 years. People, it was a transport bridge. Oh my God, the weather's nice, the light is beautiful, but it was not a place to hang out. So what happened was absolutely surprising. Nobody expected this. Um, this is what happened on the bridge. So we had pedestrians were up 165%. It was a nice place to walk now. It wasn't like, you know, four lanes of cars. Uh, cycling's up 60%, awesome. Cars down 57%, great. This is Europe, Northern Europe's busiest bus line, so there was not a big increase there. Uh, it's only 5% increase, but it's still good. But the number on the right is what happened. 1,400% <laughs> increase in people stopping on the bridge, going and sitting down. There was a guy, there was a meeting in Copenhagen, and the guy went, uh, yeah, yeah, what's up, Jens? He was probably called Jens, they're all called Jens. And um, he said, yeah, well, we got, I'm the bench guy, hi, yeah, so I got benches, and now you said you got a wider sidewalk, can I put benches out there? And they're going, Jens, do your damn bench thing, awesome, Jens, high five. Um, so he did, he just, the two benches showed up, it was, it was like an afterthought, and people just went, bench, <laughs> cool, beer, pizza, and I mean, man, in like six months after they did this, like, we have a lot of bridges in Copenhagen. In six months, I'm getting text messages going, hey, Michael, you want to meet on the bridge at four? I knew what bridge. This is the bridge. Like, it's lost its name now. Queen Louise's bridge is now the bridge. And you cycle there, like, on a sunny day, and you go along. Where? You go back. On the, on the right side in the afternoon, we got great sun there. It is completely covered with people. Cargo bikes with music, you're hearing like six different kinds of music, you know, <laughs> you know, all the way along. People are just sitting there drinking beers, watching the people on bikes go by, and pedestrians. And us on bikes, we're just going, well, oh, cool. You know, it's just humans looking at humans. That's what a city is, man. It's just humans looking at humans. So that was a complete surprise. You know, in Copenhagen, we think we know all this stuff, and we're going, whoa, what happened there? You know, just the number of people using this street went from 81,000 to 97,000. And they were walking and riding bikes and uh, taking uh, public transport. But it just, bicycle infrastructure and wider sidewalks created a beautiful destination. So it's not just transport, it's actually making the city better. So why design, you know? I'm a, I work in transport planning, you know, which is kind of boring, I mean, to call it that. I mean, for me, it's design that's important. Design is a human-to-human -human process, okay? Everything that we buy in our lives, I mean, we make design choices. You need a new toothbrush? I think I'm gonna have a green one. Oh my God, there's something on the back. I can do my tongue. That's an, you know, you're making a design choice with your clothes and all the stuff in your home, right? And um, like, you know, it's a human-to-human -human process. Whoever made this clicker somewhere in probably Asia, fine. There's a, there's a company wanting to make millions, but there's a design team going, we have to give Michael an, an amazing ergonomic experience on the stage in Riga. Like that's, that's all they wanted was me to sit there comfortably with this design and being able to click back and forth. And uh, that's all they want. Whoever designed your smartphones, they're going, oh my God, it has to be an amazing intuitive experience for, for Michael, his 11-year-old, his 88-year-old dad. You know, like that, that's what it's about. Traffic engineering and traffic planning for decades is 
outdated mathematical models, right? People, st- you know, dudes, always dudes, staring, almost always, staring at screens and uh, trying to figure out this puzzle. And, but man, streets are human, right? I want design of our streets, designed like all the other stuff that we design. Just even like a clicker. Man, imagine if we designed our streets like this clicker. I mean, it, it would be a game changer. You know, we all, chairs are the most iconic design object really in history. You know, we found like chairs from the Neolithic period. Some dude back then or woman was, you know, carving, I made a chair, <laughs> awesome. And then we find it like thousands of years later and we still design them and we've all, we've all seen stuff like this, right? Oh my God, oh, it's, a, it's an octopus, but it's a chair, fuck. Well, it's a shopping trolley, but it's, uh, you know, you can love it or hate it. It doesn't matter. None of you have four of these in your living rooms, you know, for your guests to sit on, right? And we take like chairs as a metaphor for bicycle infrastructure. You know, this is probably the uh, cycling map of Riga, you know. It's kind of bits and pieces of it. It's like not really connected in any network. There's sharp edges, all right? But hey, the man says, get out there and do it, kids. Look, it works, you know. See, I can uh, get out there. Just get out and ride. Yeah. No, we don't. None of us have six of these around our dining room table. All we want is a chair. That's all people want, you know? A chair that looks nice and serves its function. What did you all do when you came in here today? You found a seat and you sat down. It was pretty easy for you. You do it quite often, right? It's pretty intuitive, you know? I mean, you didn't have to like circle around the chair. Hmm. I see where she was going with that. Very interesting interpretation. Mm. Or like look for the on button or worry, <clears throat> worry that the, the chair was going to disappear from under you in the middle of my talk, you know, <clears throat> sitting on your ass on the floor. No, you sat down. You know, imagine if walking or cycling in a city was as easy and intuitive as that. It was for 7,000 years. It can be again. Oh yeah, so cyclists, those damn cyclists, you hear it in every city in the world, and my first response, especially if you're in like a city like Riga or wherever you are, is you can't scold cyclists for bad behavior if you have not given them the infrastructure that they deserve, the infrastructure that we know how to build, that we've been designing for a hundred years. You, you, know, you see cyclists, there's a lot of studies, like cyclists in New York blow through the red lights, not because they're that one percent, it's because they don't want to get hit by a car turning right. So they're going to, they can see the street here and they say, right, I'm going to jump across the intersection because that guy behind me is probably on his phone. You know, he's duh, duh, right? And they're just trying to, they're trying to protect themselves. So cyclists, you know, in Copenhagen, man, you just, you know, people just wait for the light to turn green. You know, check their phone. Oh, it's green. And they go. They still get there fast, A to B, right? And if you want to improve cyclist behavior, design the infrastructure for them. And we design something beautiful. Uh, you take care of it. Beautiful Danish design chair, you know, you don't let your kids draw on it or anything. You, you no, hey, this is our design chair. You take care of it. That's what we do with our infrastructure in Copenhagen. We take care of it. You know, uh, when it snows, the cycle tracks are cleared first. If it's a snowstorm, it's like those little, little bike lane cleaners up on the top left, they're buzzing back and forth six or seven times before the roads are even touched. We take really, really good care of it. Um, I have a new uh, Instagram because I still have this conversation. Oh, but we have winter here, so we're not going to ride bikes. People won't ride bikes in the winter. And I'm going, yeah, okay, so now there's a new Instagram called Vikings Biking. Vikings Biking. I just started it to shut the people up, basically. Just nothing but people cycling in snowstorms in Copenhagen and around the world. I mean, it's like, yeah, you know, with infrastructure and taking care of it, you eliminate winter, you eliminate heat, you, you, just, you basically just let people uh, transport themselves efficiently and quickly. Um, the city has a policy in Copenhagen that when I walk out of my apartment at 8 o'clock in the morning, there has to be black asphalt in, uh, in the winter. Uh, that's the policy. Because if you have, like, we have a lot of people cycling in Copenhagen, like 400,000 people coming out in the morning going, what the hell, it's like 40 centimeters of snow? Like, very few of them are going to ride a bike, right? You can't. And no public transport system in the world can, you know, in a city the size of Copenhagen can handle 400,000 new passengers from Tuesday to Wednesday, right? So we have to do it in Copenhagen. Uh, and in other cities, you have to do it to prioritize cycling, to encourage cycling. Uh, a cycling network should be taken care of. It should be like a train timetable. You should be able to count on it, right? That train should leave at 11. Boom, that bicycle infrastructure is cleared by 8. That's what you do. We have to do the math. Um, it's really important. You know, it's not like, like you can sense about what I'm talking about. It's not about, oh, save the planet. All that stuff happens, right? But you don't communicate that. And when you talk to politicians, and when I talk to politicians and, and, and other people, you know, I, I really just highlight the numbers. It's a business model. 
data is king. Whoever has the most data in a city is the most influential. If it is the citizens or the advocates, the groups, the activist groups, man, politicians better watch out because they have the power. If the politicians have all the data, then it usually works out well for the rest of us. There are no photos in this slide. Okay. Um, but in Copenhagen, 42% of the population arrive in the city of Copenhagen from all the municipalities around us uh, for work or education on a bike. That's a lot. If you live in the city of Copenhagen with an address there, 63% ride a bike. There's no left-wing hippies on bikes, you know, uh, it's just basically everybody. You know, 67% of all the politicians at the national parliament ride bikes. They just park them outside the parliament. It's an amazing thing to see. But it's simply the fastest way from A to B. 75% ride all winter. Data is important. We've been counting since 1970 regularly in Copenhagen. We have 200 spots where we, you know, you can throw a dart at a map of Copenhagen and I can probably tell you how many, bike, how many cyclists are on that stretch because we have all the data. It proves a point. See, we built the infrastructure, it works. Look, the, the numbers are up. It, uh, it, it convinces the skeptics, you know. Ah, oh, those damn bikes, I don't know. Ah, oh, look, we got the data, right? It's increasing. Um, and the right wing in Copenhagen, uh, the right wing parties, they never vote no to bicycle infrastructure. They must hate it. Oh, God, okay, but yes, fine. Because somebody can say, data, 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 data. It's a business model, man. It works. It's good for the city. Okay, fine. We'll, we'll vote for that. And it helps plan the future. Okay, we put in two here. This one's really low, but, and this one is booming, so why? And that makes you think, right? It helps you uh, move forward with your planning. Data is king. So this is, you know, like I said, I can move a lot of people through a city. We know that on a, on a standard width of 2.3 meters wide uh, on both sides of the street, you know, I can move 5,900 people per hour on bikes. On a car lane, Universal, Riga, Copenhagen, anywhere on the planet, maximum 1,300 cars per hour. And that's when the traffic's flowing smoothly, which is never, all right? So, and bus lanes, tramways, you know, 40, 50,000 people a day. We, uh, this, is, this is how we can move people. This is why we do it in Copenhagen. There's no other reason. It moves people efficiently, and we have amazing uh, public health benefits. And if you look at this, the people riding a bike in Copenhagen every year, they contribute 233 million euros to the public health. That's a lot of money. Uh, since 2011, that's 2.5 billion euros that we're just putting in our pockets, right? As a society, as a city. Um, the, since then, over the last 11 years, or 10 years, whatever, well, no, since 2011, the city has invested 286 million euros. Like, I am really bad at math. I am notoriously bad at math. I can see that that makes sense. You know, you spend 286 million over 10 years, but you're actually making 2.5 billion? It is the greatest business model in the history of transportation. That's why we do it. This is money that you can invest. It's not like, theoretically, we're making some money on public health. No, it's money that the politicians can budget next year. Oh, how much do we make? Great, we're gonna put that into schools, parks, whatever. It's real money that can be budgeted. We know that in Denmark, if I, every time somebody rides a bike one kilometer, like this guy, like this, uh, we earn 25 cents. Just put, bing, you know, I'm just like throwing money into my city as I ride my bike to work, right? Every time somebody drives a car one kilometer, we're paying out 87 cents. We're throwing it into this big black hole and we're never ever seeing it again. It, we, you never see it again. And we have 150% tax on cars in Copenhagen, I mean Denmark, right? If you don't have that tax here in, in Latvia, which you don't, that number is even more obscene. It is really uh, the best business model and really the worst business model in the history of transportation right there on the screen. Yeah, you know, shopkeepers, oh, you know, I need parking outside my shop. No, you don't. Like, we, we have that, we, I have eight parking spots for, for customers outside this shop, right? Bike racks right next to the cycle track. Um, we know that good bicycle infrastructure increases the profits in shops, right? All over the world, for 40 years, every single study has shown that there's an increase of, you know, up to 50%, 30 to 50% profits for the shops along these streets. It's a business model. Cyclists, people who ride bikes, they spend more money in shops than motorists do, like 100 euros on average each month. Because I'm in the supermarket every day. I don't drive there on a Saturday, load up the car, and drive away. I'm in the supermarket every day. I'm riding along the streets going, sale. Oh my God, I'm going to stop. I'm going to buy something, right? I'm, 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 I'm a better consumer. So this is like, you know, Copenhagen wasn't always Copenhagen. In the 1960s, this is one of our main squares. It looks like this all over Europe. Just a huge car parking spot. That's the square now on the left. 
And uh, it, of course, it's a much better public space. It's like a beautiful place. Um, interesting to, look, to note that there are exactly the same number of parking spots in both photos. On the left, it's just bike racks. So there's just as many citizens engaging in the city center for whatever reason they're doing so. Um, no, car, no parking spots were harmed. It's all been invented. Like, I'm not theorizing here. It's not some crazy idea I had in a dream. This is, it's all been invented. Everything we need. Except for, like, an efficient uh, clicker. Oh, there is. Um, yeah. So, like, since 1915 in Copenhagen, that was when we first separated bikes from the rest of the traffic. 1915. That's a photo of it there on the left. Yeah, motorized vehicles, bikes have their own space, pedestrians have their own space. That is the, 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 the key. And, um, and you separate physically with a curb or with some sort of barriers to stop the cars from coming into the intersection, like into the, into the bike lane. It's that simple. Generations of planners before me have done all the work. This is the gold standard. In Denmark, we have only four types of bicycle infrastructure in our planning. I have the easiest job in the world, okay? Michael, we need infrastructure on this street. And I'm going, yeah, okay. So how many cars per 24 hours? Awesome. And what's the speed limit for those cars? Great. That's number two or number three. Copy, paste. Send an invoice. It's not, not that easy, but it should be. I'm working on that. I mean, it's really, there, nobody has a discussion in Denmark. The engineers and the planners all know each other. They all have a similar education, uh, and they, they know exactly what to do. So there's no infrastructure because it's a residential street. The speed limit goes up. We start to, you know, separate, uh, you know, with paint. And then we go to the, the one on the bottom right, which is hard physical infrastructure. That's the gold standard. That is like, you know, 95% of all the infrastructure in, in Copenhagen is that. Um, and then you don't, I know here in Riga you have like a bi-directional. You know, we don't do that in, in, in our cities at all. But copy-pasting this is the easiest solution. Cities save money, they get instant results, they, you know, it's, it's design, right? Somebody designed this already, so you just copy-paste the best design. You buy a chair with four legs because that works. That design has been established. So when you see people like try, cities putting in crazy stuff like uh, bi-directional like this along a street, no. Nah, you know, we threw this away 20 years ago in, Copen in Denmark because it wasn't safe enough. Then you see other weird stuff like uh, bike lanes on the wrong side of parked cars, in between the door zone and moving traffic. It's the stupidest place to put people on bikes. Protects the paint job of the car is really nice with all these squishy cyclists, right? And then you see stuff like this. Uh, luckily, very few cities, they just put bike lanes down the middle of a busy street with cars doing 50 or 60. I mean, would you put like sidewalks down the middle of a street? No. Why would you put bikes down the middle of a street? You know, you want your kid to, to walk there or ride a bike there? No. So when you see like politicians uh, or planners doing really stupid stuff, uh, say no. Just say no. So it's a thing, right? Uh, we do the Copenhagenized Index. We uh, rank 136 cities around the world, also because nobody did it, so we said we want to we try that. Um, and it's, it's game on all over the world. Like the, it's the craziest cities that are moving fast. Weird cities. Seville, 45 degrees in the summer. And they put in an infrastructure network, and they went from 0.2% on bikes to 7% in only four years. They're like the darlings in my industry. Amazing. Uh, also, Buenos Aires is doing the same. Infrastructure network fell out of the sky. It's not one bike lane here or there. It's a network. It's not great infrastructure, but it's working. They are just going from nothing. One guy named Juan riding through Buenos Aires, and now there's like, you know, streets with 9,000 bikes a day. Um, Oslo, they have winter. They have hills. They have just removed 3,000 car parking spots in the city uh, over the past two years. They're putting in 140 kilometers of bike lanes. They are closing off the city center to private cars. Uh, they're going for it. Ljubljana, they did it in the, in the 70s, way ahead of the curve. The mayor there, they had 2% on bikes, and the mayor said, um, I want more, like in 1970s. And he went, and they said, well, uh, Copenhagen? Okay, so fly to Copenhagen, you know, okay. And they, I just imagine these people from Ljubljana taking photos with like their Holga cameras, like click. Click, click, like spies. And they went back and they said, this is what they do in Copenhagen. And the mayor said, do that here. They went from 2% to 10% in one year because they put in best practice infrastructure. The competition is getting tougher. Out of these 136 cities that we rank, we only publish the top 20, but I can reveal to you that Riga is at number 71. Oh, what the fuck? Um, yeah. So it's really only up from there, Riga. Jesus. Even Calgary, like in Canada, what, where's that? You know, it's just like they're putting in a network of, they put in a network of infrastructure, minus 30 in the winter. Yeah, they're doing it. 
So when you grew up in the Cold War, or you live in Latvia today, <laughs> the Russians are coming has a bit of a scary feel to it, right? No, the Russians are coming. Um, and so, yeah, sorry about that. But, uh, <laughs> so like three years ago, I, we got a phone, like an email from, uh, from Tartarstan, a little city in Tartarstan, 160,000 people. And they're going, yes, hello, please, to make my city most bicycle friendly in, in all of Russia. <laughs> and, and we're going, okay, like what? Seriously? Like we didn't believe it. You know, sanctions, the euro and the ruble, ah, this is the whatever, dude, yeah. Yes, okay, please come. And we, they, we flew us into the city. And uh, Almetyevsk is the name. None of my planner friends in Russia had ever heard of this place. It's an oil city. 7% of the oil in Russia comes out of the ground around the city. Uh, so they're wealthy, but uh, they have an oil company there. And they, they're like, yeah. We, I want, the mayor just gets it. 35-year-old dude, young guy, charismatic. I get it. He's building like parks and lakes with beaches. Like everybody, and the first guy in Russia to do this. And uh, he says, I want to be the most bicycle-friendly city. You're the experts. Tell us what to do. My engineers, they'll just listen to anything you say. It's like the most perfect client for anybody in any industry. It's like, it's the, I mean, seriously, it's a dream client. You know, yeah, make it blue. Okay, we make it blue, or whatever. It's like, but right now, today, as I'm standing here, the best bicycle infrastructure on the planet is in Elmetyevsk, in Tartarstan. It's amazing. And our goal for them is that they will have 10% cycling uh, within five years. They have two years left, and they're at 8%. Like, it's just, it's epic. They bought snow lane cleaners. I mean, they have, they, they, he just did everything that he needs to do. This guy gets it, man. It's amazing to see. Um, Detroit, we just handed them 220-page bad boy document because uh, they want to be the mobility city now. They don't want to be the motor city. Amazing. Detroit, Almetius, all of these cities around the world. If you're not in this game, Riga, if you're not in this game, it's getting embarrassing. Because this is a thing. This is what cities are doing, man. You want to be hanging with the cool kids, this is what you do. When you got these kind of weird cities doing it, you know that we're, uh, we're moving. We need to build monuments, people. You know, like I, you know, I, a lot of people, oh, tech. You know, tech can save the world. No, it can't. I mean, and, and technology is incredibly important. Um, and really, we have to apply technology intelligently. In Copenhagen, on all of our main streets leading to the city center, the speed limit is all the traffic lights are coordinated for 20 kilometers per hour. It's called the green wave. And when you're riding your bike, you just, you just never stop. You're just hitting the lights all the way in. Beautiful flow. Numbers of cyclists are up. We have little sensors on certain intersections. So if it's raining or snowing or the temperature's cold, the traffic lights give cyclists three to four times more crossings. And the, car, the people in the cars can just wait because they have the heater on, listening to music. So it's just like we have technology can it help us uh, with our existing designs. That's incredibly important. I get all these big data companies calling me going, hey man, we're like SAP. We're going to do a hackathon weekend about how to use big data to get people to ride bikes. And I'm going, fuck off. Like, I'm, I'm seriously, I'm going, no. I see, like, it depends what mood I'm in if I say that or something else. And, and I'm going, seriously, save your money. Because big data is not going to get people to ride bikes. You know, infrastructure will. We have 100 years of experience. So we have to think about how we can use data and how we can use tech to help what we already have built. But we're building monuments. You know, we have the most famous monument in, uh, in Copenhagen is this little naked green woman on a rock. You know, half fish, half woman, staring wistfully out to sea. You know, and she's like this big. 113 years, people, Americans get off the tour buses. Where is it? Where is that little mermaid, honey? Damn, we gotta see that little mermaid. And then it's like, oh, what the, it's so small. Yeah, it's life-sized, right? But still, I hate her. I like the story, but I think it's a stupid monument for a city as cool as Copenhagen. So we build stuff like this for bikes. And that is our greatest monument, is the infrastructure network for bicycles. That is the greatest thing we've ever done. <coughs> that is a human monument. It, it, it's ever-changing. It's never going to be the same at any point in time. It's always going to be morphing into something different. And everybody who uses it is a designer and an architect of, these, of this monument. And it's, it's open source. It's the same in the Netherlands, in German cities. These monuments are rising all over the world. It's monuments to the people, you know, not like monuments to like white dudes who started wars. I mean, that's basically every monument, right? It's like some white guy who did, killed some people, so we make a statue or something. Um, these are monuments for the people living in our cities now, the people who will be living in our cities in the future, monuments that can stand for hundreds of years. This is what we need to do. I always say, if you don't see bicycles, I don't care if you ride a bike. Like, that doesn't really matter. A lot of people can and will. If you don't see the bicycle as part of the solution to our cities, then you're part of the problem. 
And you can make the choice. We can all be the designers and architects. Be a problem or be a monument builder. It's up to you. Thank you.